I just want to welcome everyone. Um, I am Barbara Way, and I am the director of the Front Warrior Women's Resource Center. And um, I wanted to introduce you just a little bit to the Front Royal Women's Resource Center if you know nothing about us. Um, we do this monthly woman gathering and we hope you will enjoy this. Uh, we will record it and it will be around for viewing later. Um, we are basically a 5013C and uh, we're a nonprofit and we our, our mission is to empower women to change their world. And we do this by connecting through this networking. We give grants to women and girls and um, we do educational programs. We do all sorts of things, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, but in the meantime, um, thank you for joining us. Please visit us at our website, which is um, frwrc.org, Front Royal Women's Resource Center.org. Um, and there's lots and lots of events. We have emails, we have all sorts of things going on. I want to talk to you a little bit before we start our program. Um, Eka Capiotis is our host, and our guest is Don Devine, and we're really excited. Uh, before I get into that, I will just tell you about a few things that are going on. Um, as I said, you know, it's here we are in the brand new year and um, I will tell you about a few things that are happening right now. Tina will uh, put information in the chat so that if you want to find out more, you can. So I don't want to talk too long. Um, it is the new year and because of it, um, we are starting our membership drive. And um, that is one of the things that we invite you, if you are not a member, please, please consider being a member. And I see Tina has put that in the chat. Um, you can join, you can renew and re-up. Uh, truly consider being a sustaining member, which you could do for as little as $3 a month. So that's something to think about. Um, in addition, we're going to be celebrating our members and um, our, our Dare to Dreamers. And next month at this time, in, instead of our women gathering, we're gonna have a membership gathering. And we're going to, so you'll watch for details. There'll be more about that, but we hope you will all join us. You can find out more about the Resource Center. You can meet some of our Dare to Dream grantees. There's all sorts of things that you can do. Next, um, I do want to tell you that we have just closed our Dare to Dream grant. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll have that, um, we'll have a gathering in February and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, that's, that membership gathering is the 14th, the 17th of February. That'll be the third Thursday at 7 p.m., same time. Um, after that, we're going to have our Dare to Dream breakfast and uh, we'll do an online auction for that. And that is in March. And you'll find more about all those things later. Uh, lastly, and um, really uh, the next big, big thing we're doing is the Women's Wellness Workshop. And that is Saturday, February 5th. It's all virtual. Um, and we are hoping you will join us. It is filling up fast. We have some amazing presenters and we have all sorts of beautiful bags with goodies in them and things for the workshop and beyond um, and the first 50 get them. So those are all the big things that are happening right now. I don't wanna take any more time right now. What I'd like to do is introduce our host, Eka Capiotis. So Eka, if you join us, um, she's gonna be our moderator. She is an integrative body worker. She's a longtime member and supporter of the Front Royal Women's Resource Center. And she continually brings amazing women to our gathering. And she is an amazing woman herself. Um, and I'm hoping she will join us here because if not, that's gonna be weird. Eka. <laughs> okay, I'm trying. I'm getting a message that says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Ooh, 
Okay, <laughs> let's see. Let me see if I can figure that out. Participate. Sorry. Nope. Okay, try that. Yay. Yay. Okay. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Sorry about that little glitch. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't be Zoom without glitches. <laughs> isn't that the truth? <laughs> Thank you. I'm really excited about the women's wellness workshops. I think you, you know, you've done again a great um a great job lining up some really wonderful people, including me. <laughs> of which you are one. Yes. I know. <laughs> but I am very happy to have been invited. So I'm um, looking forward to it. But it's a, it's a great lineup. There's, it's hard to choose which one to go to. It is. It is. Yeah. You're absolutely right. There's, there's some amazing speakers. So anyway, but yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Barbara. I'm, um, I'm, I'm here to introduce Dawn and um Dawn and Dawn, if you could also now unmute yourself. Yay! It worked. <laughs> Hi, welcome, welcome. Hello. Um, Dawn Devine, director of the Shenandoah Valley Discovery Museum. And you recently, or not that recently, you recently moved to Front Royal, but in the not too distant um, past, moved from Minnesota and brought your whole family with you to come here for this. We did, we did. We um, we came out to specifically for the job, my job to be the director of the Discovery Museum. I had opened a children's museum in Minnesota and then I did um, exhibit design for children's museums across the country. And we had decided um, we owned a farm back home in Minnesota. We had a horse farm that we did therapeutic riding on. And uh, we decided that we were done with the 40 below zero weather and <laughs> the snow. So um, there's about 300 children's museums across the country, but oftentimes executive directors stay for a long time before they retire. So we looked um, and we found a couple out on the East Coast. And this one, the Discovery Museum has been around for 25 years and has great history here. It's a pretty large museum for the size town um, that we're in and the area that we serve. So um, it really resonated with us and it's warmer here. Although in the last couple of weeks, we feel like maybe <laughs> there's been some false advertising because we got a lot of snow and ice, um, but yeah, we've really enjoyed it. And then we, um, as Eka said, we moved down to Front Royal. Um, we came right before COVID, literally a few months before COVID. Who would have known? Um, and so then we rented up in Winchester for a while, and then we actually found and bought a house down in Front Royal. So we moved down here a few months ago and getting ourselves all acclimated to the area and love the mountains and the scenery. So we're enjoying it so far. Oh, good. I don't think they're not really mountains in uh, Minnesota, are there? No. And actually, my <laughs> daughter would tell you, we've been lucky enough to travel quite a bit in our life. That's our one hobby. Um, and uh, my daughter always tells me that unless there's snow on the top, they're not real mountains. And I'm like, oh. no, honey, these are just <laughs> older mountains. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it looks like when you age a little bit but the nice things are is you don't have to you know climb up one side of the mountain with your car and then down the other side it's it's fairly easy to get around in these mountains but it's beautiful it's just wonderful and we've started to kind of see a little bit of the area but um yeah we're still kind of getting used to front royal and all the areas around here but We've enjoyed it so far. <laughs> well, good. Well, welcome. I'm glad you. I'm glad you came. And you have a really interesting history. But I thought before we got into that, I would love for you to share a bit about what the Shenandoah Valley Discovery Museum, who who it is, who you are, and what you do there. We would definitely, we do actually, we host steam nights down here in um, Front Royal in Warren County. Um, but the, the Discovery Museum, I think is always unique for people to know what a children's museum is. Um, I think a lot of people on first view, they kind of think of it as like a park um, and just an indoor park that you can play at. And it's really very different than that. Um, a children's museum, the concept behind a children's museum is very unique in that it is an educational facility that is specifically run for the education and cognitive development of children, usually ages birth to eight to 10. Um, and it really is all about being a hands-on 
not drop-off center. Uh, one of the unique things I always love about a children's museum is it invites multi-generational, so grandparents, aunts, uncles, and parents to come in with their children and and play. Um, and and really, um, I, one of my my areas of expertise was um, cognitive development in the early er in what's called the perinatal area, so pre-birth to age five, and um, play is really the best way for kids to learn. So for years and years, I, I lectured uh, medicine, general medicine, about cognitive development for all ages. And one of the things we I always talked about was hands-on learning is really the best, no matter what age you are. But for birth to age three, it's the only way to learn. So kids trial and error, putting things in their mouth, touching things, interacting with things, hearing vocabulary, it's really the only way that kids, their brain actually develops. Um, so for a long time, I taught labor and delivery and I would always ask people, what year in your life did you learn the most? And it's somewhat of a trick question. I'll let you guys think for yourself for a minute. Um, if it was a group setting, I'd have you guys answer. But um, uh, oftentimes people think of like the year that they like their teacher the most. So they're like, oh, in second grade, I love my second grade teacher. So I, I think I learned the most then. But the actual right answer is, oh, I had one man once in a group tell me that the year he learned the most was the year he got married because his wife taught him stuff. And I was like, as a woman, that's the right answer, but it's not the right answer. So the right answer is your first year of life. So you started and were born as a blob. And by the end of your first year of life, you socially interacted, you could smile, you did fine motor and were able to pick up things and put them into your mouth. You, most of you were able to do some sort of gross motor, whether that is sitting up, crawling, or some of you were walking by the end of your first year. And never again in your life do you learn that much, but you didn't learn it through tests. You didn't learn it through flashcards you learned it from literally interacting with an adult caregiver and trial and error on your own. And that's really what play is. So um, we always tell people, you know, when is the most important brain development? Well, 90 plus percent of your brain is myelinated by the end of your third year. And so through talking to your child, um, taking them to Martin's and saying, this apple's red, this orange is orange this banana is yellow using vocabulary showing them different things there's a bazillion ways that as uh, an adult or caregiver of a young child that you can teach them the discovery museum just happens to be a fun place because it's child focused um, but the rest of the world is open for education and teaching as well so i'm really excited about it i'm passionate about it i love what children's museums do um, and i think we are really a voice for families and in advocacy. We are also, like Barbara said, we are a nonprofit. We are 501c3. Um, and so we literally um, work very hard to open our doors as wide as possible and welcome as many people in as possible. So if you haven't been up to the Discovery Museum, 2021 was our 25th year of being open and you need to check us out. We are great fun. We right now until um, Valentine's Day weekend, we have a skating rink, a sock skating rink on our roof and it overlooks the old town. So it's really fun, fun getaway for families and for people with kids under 10. A sock, sock skating rink? <laughs> yes, we actually, we have a rooftop and I didn't realize there's a lot of historic buildings in old town Winchester. So I didn't realize we had the only rooftop. And so when I first moved here, you know, all of the staff was like, people just don't go up on the roof when it's cold. And so we were talking about it and they're, I said, well, we need to come up with a way to make it more engaging. And I said, back home in Minnesota, we would just flood it, make an, a skating rink and then kids would come up and skate. Well, of course, you know, the staff here was like, you can't do that here, it won't stay frozen. <laughs> and so we were able to, it took us a couple of years, but we found a synthetic surface and now we got it sponsored and have a sock skating rink that we put out just for the holiday season from Thanksgiving till usually it's just January, but this year we had enough sponsorship to take us through till Valentine's Day. But it's great fun to be out there and sock skating and looking out over the whole old town. It's fun. That sounds so wonderful. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, it's all these so creative we, stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So, so take me on a little virtual tour. Take us on a little tour. So when you walk in the door, what what's that like when you walk in? What happens? So we have we have four floors. The top floor is the rooftop and there's a vestibule. The first floor, when you first come in, we actually have a full size ambulance. Um, the kids can play in and interact with. There is a health exhibit that it surrounds it that has a lot of different exam tables, things that I, I love a children's museum because part of the idea behind it is, is to make spaces that you would find in the community that can be educational spaces. Um, my background is in medicine. I, I lecture general medicine for years and years and years. And I always worked in peds. And one of the key things for kids is to have some experiences in medical settings when it's not scary. Well, of course, that's really hard because the first about 18 months, well child checkups is every time you bring them in, they get a shot. So having a, a medical setup in a place that you'll, you won't get hurt, um, it's, it can lead to a lot of great medical fun play that allows a child to interact with it. They get to look at x-rays. They get to see, we have a big body scanner that can show you what it looks like, whether you've had an x-ray, a CT scan, and a, or an MRI scan. But even as an adult, it's very neat to see if you're looking at soft tissue, if you're looking at the bones themselves, and how you compare those things, and maybe why a doctor orders different things on you for different reasons. Um, but it's really a wonderful place to allow kids to interact with things that are typically scary for them. So, you know, we have stethoscopes, we have lab coats they can dress up in, we have a full-fledged ambulance. So that is great fun. Our first floor also has a climbing maze um, that kids can climb up. It's great gross motor because, of course, in the middle of winter when they can't do anything else, it's always lovely to be able to get them going and um, see if they can sleep better at night. Um, and then we have an illusion house. Our second floor is the one space that has um, wh what I think is iconic of the Shenandoah Valley. It is the apple packing shed. So there is, it's a wonderful collaborative place for kids of all ages to come in and do what happens in the, the foothills around here, which is picking apples and, and packing apples. And we have little conveyor belts that they can use. And, um, and then of course we have a farmer's market that they can sell the apples at. And then we have a little baby bistro area that they can cook and create things. Um, we have a waterway on second floor which is surrounded by murals of all of the native animals and species within this area. So there's um, there's some mountains, there's a riverbed, there's all the different areas and ecosystems that are in the Shenandoah Valley, which is great fun. Um, we have a roller coaster exhibit where we have little different size ramps that kids can put together. Um, the best part about the roller coaster exhibit, it happens to be outside of my office. And I will walk out there and so many times we'll see literally like a grandfather, a, their grandchild and their son all working on these together. Um, and occasionally I'll come out and they'll only be adults playing and I'll be like did you bring a kid to the museum <laughs> but they have such fun and it, it really is meant to be fun and learning for all ages our third floor has um, building blocks they we have a huge thing called imagination play, playground blocks we have a studio space we have a classroom for that we also host birthday parties. We have summer camps. We have tons of summer camps that we use the classroom for. And then we have a full natively built longhouse. So we actually had a, a Native American who built the longhouse based on the actual um, building that happens, like literally shaving the bark, hand carving a, a canoe. That's also on third floor. So lots and lots of lots of interaction. And then right now we always have a rooftop garden and we have a rooftop music area and a little stage area. But right now we have the sock skating rink. So, and we have some fun things coming in the near future. We hope to uh, roll out a new exhibit sometimes in, sometime in 2022 as well. So we're really excited. There should be a lot of change, um, but there's always fun stuff to do. Oh, and I should tell you, 
we should you should pre-register if you want to come we are open wednesday through saturday um we're open 9 30 to 3 30 and you we we encourage people to pre-register on our website um you can buy tickets on the door but we do still have a capacity limit because of covid um and so occasionally we are full so occasionally we, we turn people away, but we also have free first Fridays. So if you want to come up and just try it out, um, the first Friday of every month is underwritten by Bank of Clark County from five to seven. You pre-register because that it always does fill up. Free first Fridays always does. But bring your nephews, nieces, grandchildren and come up and try it out. And it, it really is great fun. And free first Fridays are oftentimes the best time to trial it out and then see if you want to buy tickets buy membership but yes yeah, it's, it's great fun oh that's yeah. so cool it just sounds it sounds wonderful oh so and so how much is it to be either a member or to uh, to visit so regular tickets are nine dollars per person um for anybody two and up so under two is free. Um, we do have a museums for all program that we have underwritten. So anybody that has an active EBT card, they can bring their EBT card and then tickets are $2 for up to four family members. So we try really hard again to welcome as many people as possible. We do, we have family memberships um, and we have premier memberships. Our family memberships allow four people in and it's $125 for the year. Our premier membership actually not not only allows you into our children's museum, but it also gets you half price to any other children's museum in the, in the ACM network. And there's about 200 children's museums in the in ACM network. So if you travel a lot, um, I've been lucky enough, I visited about 30 children's museums from coast to coast, and some of them are just phenomenal. But most big cities have them. It's fairly rare for a medium-sized town to have this large of a children's museum. But if you travel, it is definitely worth your while. It also gives you discounts on birthday parties and our summer camps. So if you're looking for summer camps and stuff, the premier membership is, is definitely worth its while. It sounds really amazing. I'm not sure why. Are you hearing a weird feedback? I don't. It's just me. Okay, it's just me. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I don't, but I'm, it, it may be. I don't know if anybody else has said anything. Okay, I haven't heard. Anyway, um, I'll try not to talk too much because you're much more interesting anyway. Well, this is really such a cool thing. I've never been there, I have to admit. I don't have children. I have some grown stepchildren and who knows maybe someday we'll have some littler ones to bring yep. but uh it sure sounds like a lot of fun and and what a unique job i mean how did you get interested in this so weirdly enough because there's you know there's only 300 children's museums it's not like a community where there's six banks and so when you work in one bank you go to the other bank um children's museums most people who come to children's museums come from very bizarre and different backgrounds. Um, so my background is is odd. <laughs> so as I said, I, I worked in, in medicine for a long time. I worked in peds. Um, I have a master's in medical education. And so I lectured general medicine at colleges for about a decade. Um, and I'm a licensed parent educator. Um, so I've always been excited about families and I've always been very passionate about early learning. Um, and so I actually lectured for a long time and then I moved up in the ranks in educational administration. I was a dean of a college back home. Um, so ironically, and this will probably make sense to a lot of people, um, I was the dean of the college in Rochester, Minnesota. And of course, the largest employer, if you know anything about Rochester, Minnesota, is Mayo Clinic. And so we, um, that is the home of the Mayo Clinic. And so at a certain point, um, the community decided that they wanted a children's museum and they decided they wanted it to be more science-based. And so they approached me, I had not worked. At that point, I had been the Dean of the college for about six years and um, missed pediatrics. I missed kids a lot. Um, and so they asked if I would be willing to open the museum. Um, and my faculty teased me because they're like, well, she should, she's the biggest kid we know. And so I was sad to say goodbye to all my faculty, but it was great. It was a wonderful way for me to actually use my research and my work in, in cognitive development, but then also every day see it happening. So it's totally different when you're actually out there, you know, 
I, I built the museum, um, worked on it for a long time. And then I actually, after I had opened the museum and was the director for a long time, I actually went into exhibit design. So I did some design work for children's museums across the country um, for several years too. Um, and that was just thrilling for me to be able to use the creative piece of actual curriculum design, but then also see it come to fruition and be built and, and work as traveling exhibits. So that was really exciting. But but we did, we got a little sick of the cold back home. Um, my daughter finished her undergrad and uh, my daughter's studying to be a veterinarian. And so she ended up, her vet school is out here. And so we were like, we just need to leave the cold and find somewhere warmer. So yeah, we came out here and um, we've, it's been wonderful, but it is an odd background to bring it to this. But then ironically, when COVID happened, it ended up being great because I had worked in hospitals long enough that I had been part of um, some accreditation systems. So I knew some of the background of um, the cleanliness and what needed to go into some of the um, sanitation of hospitals and place centers in within hospitals. Um, so when COVID happened, it worked out really good that I had that background. And so ironically, I reached out to, there are seven children's museums throughout the state of Virginia. And so I reached out to the other children's museums and said, hey, you guys, we're all in the same boat. COVID is very strange. And would we, you guys be willing to come together and form a collective so that we can create some best practices for reopening and for children's museums? And so we have since created a Virginia Collective, which is a, a group of all the executive directors from children's museums. And now the science centers within the state have joined us as well. So it's been so wonderful to create that network. And that's one of the things I come away with from COVID is COVID has really given us a chance to build those networks and learn from each other and reach out in, in support. Um, and that has been just wonderful um, for me to now be in a state where there are so many children's museums and we now get to share and, and learn from each other and support each other. So when I heard about this and was invited to this, um, I, I think this women's group is exactly what I really think resonates through this whole COVID experience is how do we come together and support each other and really learn from each other? So I was very excited to be a part of this and be invited to be part of this. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for coming. And then also I feel like we're so lucky to have, have you in our community because it sounds like you, you bring just a wealth of information and enthusiasm and, and passion and, um, you know, also the ability to reach out and connect with other people. When you were talking about um, how kids learn by putting things in their mouth, I thought, well, what happens then with COVID? I mean, yep. you had to really think through that one, huh? That's exactly, that becomes some of the challenges where, you know, it's one thing to ask adults, to please stand six feet apart. It's another thing to ask an 18 month old at a water table to stand six feet away from the other one and to not share toys. And so that has been a huge thing for all of us to learn about, you know, the difference between cleaning and disinfecting and what can disinfection look like and what does it need to kill and how often do you need to do it? And it's a huge learning situation, especially when you think about the fact routinely we have about 55,000 visitors come through our door in a year. So when you're thinking about on a weekly basis, the number of families that come through, we do still, um, we still require masks because of course, 80% of our visitors are under 12 and can't get vaccinated. And so, or are slow to getting vaccinated now, they're finally starting to vaccinate them. But um, so it's a lot of learning and educating the community, learning what disinfecting is and how to do that. Uh, but it is, it's a lot of different things that you wouldn't even think of um, when you start thinking of running a children's museum, or I, I think for a lot of people who work in preschool and childcare, you don't think about now all of a sudden it's rising to the top of those safety pieces and the cleanliness and the disinfecting pieces. And so it is, it's learning a lot from each other. And I think being open to trial and error, but just like 
how children learn the best with trial and error as adults when we get into situations where we open ourselves up to allowing ourselves to fail that's really the only time that we actually then also learn and get a chance to uh, possibly succeed <laughs> But that's yeah, scary that's, as an adult. That's, that's, that's <laughs> it's, it's scary. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for saying that. It's like we've got to keep hearing that as adults over and over again, don't we? <laughs> it is. Oh. It's so hard. And it's mm -hmm. just, I think we just, you know, all of us, as you get older, you you are used to being right and you're used to having to know. So when we don't know, I think sometimes it gets to be a very scary situation, but it's helping us learn. I don't think there's, I wouldn't say this has been a wonderful experience, but I think there's been good takeaways from COVID. Uh, I agree. I, I agree. I think we, we found a lot of things that work that we never thought would work and, and having to be creative in a completely different way. So, yeah. Um, so, like, I know that you have a lot of passion around it. Is there like, what would you like people to take away from, from this conversation? I guess I would say my most important thing and probably the thing that I am most apt to go out and speak about is that, that children are really our best, the community's best asset. And how do we value that in a way that not only helps children, but provides the foundation that a family offers a child? Uh, that I think as an advocate for a children's museum and for cognitive development and families throughout the years has probably been one of my biggest pieces is I think that um, more and more we slip into a world where it's very simple to put children on hold for a long period of time. We're on the phone, we're texting, we are on the computer, we are not as attentive to our children and what's going on in our world. And so that's one of the things that I'm very passionate about is the Children's Museum, I believe if nothing else, gives you a time and a place where you make a devoted effort to come there and put your children first and really pay attention to them and be truly tuned into what they're doing um, and use different vocabulary and scaffold what you do and how you talk to your children, give different examples, call up some ideas. Um, just today when I was walking through the space, there was actually a grandmother in the space that was literally telling her child, I remember when I used to play with, with water it was literally in the backyard and you know we had this lovely little area that they had a pond that had like little bushes around it and stuff and I thought for myself that's some of the stuff that happens that real conversation where they're sharing some of their own personal history and their their grandchild is listening to it and they're making memories and that really to me is so key but it also is helping a child's brain myelinate. It is helping a child learn more vocabulary. It is having eye-to-eye -eye contact, which is absolutely necessary in cognitive development. There are so many things that are happening that you don't even know you're doing that are happening so simply. Um, there's a study that was done to, that I always like to quote because I think it's so amazing to me. Literally, they studied 500 kids who had parents who devoted 15 minutes a day of talking to just that child. And what went into that is, is you had to make eye to eye contact with the child. It had to be just you with that child. So if you had other children, you had to devote 15 minutes to just that one child throughout the day. And it could be two minutes here or there, but 15 minutes total in one day. And I think we all think to ourselves, that's not that much time, 15 minutes in a day, but really, 15 minutes of devoted, completely undistracted eye to eye contact is, is really a huge commitment. And then they studied 15 minutes, families who had children that didn't devote the 15 minutes to it. By the time these children started kindergarten, the 500 children that had, had devoted 15 minutes of eye to eye contact had 5,000 more words in their vocabulary just starting kindergarten. So literally, just having eye to eye contact and communication where the parent is literally interacting and hearing what their child is saying makes that much of a difference. 
So now you add on reading a book to them, 15 to 20 minutes a day. It is an exponential thing, but it really needs to be valued because in our world right now, there's so many things to distract from that important interaction time. And so I think that the more we can hear it, the more we can celebrate it, that any time that you can spend that isn't distracted time, talking, interacting, reading, playing, having fun, playing games, and literally responding to your children, it makes such a huge difference down the road. So that would be my biggest takeaway is it really is, in many ways, it's our future. And in bigger ways, it really is our, our best source of joy. So I, I love and would love to encourage more and more of that kind of interaction. And even if, even if you don't have children of your own, there are many opportunities to be able to do and interact with young children in those same ways and encourage all of those same projects for young children. But the younger, the better, most definitely. We encourage people to read to their children from the time they're three months pregnant. If you can read 15 minutes a day from the time you're three months pregnant, myelination happens right from right from prenatal development all the way up through that for end of the third year of life is when by the time 90% of it is done. So that is amazing. That is so cool. I had no idea. Well, there's so many things that you brought up this evening that I just feel like we could just keep talking about this and communicating. I bet that there are a lot of questions and I'm kind of wondering, is there a way to take any questions and do we have time? Um, I don't, uh, actually, I don't think that there are any questions. Uh, um, I can, I can also open it up. Um, and um, let's see. I can allow everyone to talk. There we go. The power of Zoom. I know. <laughs> I, can, I can even promote people to panelists, but right now, I think I've allowed everyone to talk. So if you all want to unmute, um, we, can, we can talk and have questions. And if you'd like your video on, um, I see Joyce. Hey, Joyce. I looked in the chat too to see if anybody wrote anything in the chat. Uh, I don't. There were questions, but I don't see anything down I there. See anything through the chat? I will take um, comments too. If anyone has a comment, feel free to put it in the chat or to. Um, can you raise your hand here? Raise your hand. Um, everybody. Oh, yeah. Um, so I don't know if ever, everyone should be able to hear me, but literally everyone can unmute and talk right now, I think. And let me know if you can't. I see Joey's unmuted. Paula. Paula here. Huh? There we go. Very, Very cool. cool. Jan, Kathy, Critier. Okay, so... Um, Zoom does all sorts of cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if anyone has questions. I will say that I have been to the Children's Museum. It was before um, the, the sock. Um, ah. Thing. <laughs> so my, my grandchildren were here. It was a couple of years ago. So it might have been right before you came. Um, but I was blown away by what an amazing like you said it's it's really big yeah it's huge i mean it's really for big. a town this size it is huge i mean yeah. really when you think about it and it's four floors it's nine we have nineteen thousand square feet when you include the rooftop mm -hmm. um and it is yeah it's huge it's a huge resource for the whole area yeah. but and warren county just so you guys know warren county we used to have a um a contract with them so that most of the kids under fourth grade and under came for a field trip but 
po with COVID, we haven't been able to do that. Winchester and Frederick County have both reinstated and Clark County have all reinstated their contracts. And so they're doing on-site field trips and they're also, we do virtual field trips as well. But I know with Warren County, I know you also, in the meantime, there was also a changeover, I think in superintendents as well. But but that's a, a, a fun way also to get to see the museum is through field trips and such. Yeah. But we'll continue to kind of reach out and see about that. But there's so many fun things, I think. And actually just moving to the area, um, we've been overwhelmed by, we've been up to Great Falls. We went to Bell Grove. We went to, we've been down to Charlottesville. We drove up to Gettysburg. We've drove to Hershey. We went over to Annapolis. I mean, there's so much around here within a short period of time. It's, mm -hmm. it's cool. Yeah. It's just wonderful. Well, of course, we've been to the National Park that we've done that quite a bit. But we, um, where was the other place? We, so our youngest son is in a wheelchair. So we, we have to kind of look at accessibility. And uh, unfortunately, so hiking's not in our world very much. Um, and kayaking isn't very much either. We tried once and we rolled the kayak and Joe was like, okay, we're done with that. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why. <laughs> Maybe a raft. <laughs> yes. You could do a raft. <laughs> so the, yeah, like a pontoon or something. Yeah, we'll so something with a little more stability. And <laughs> we need that, let me tell you. But we've heard that the, not, the Shenandoah State Park, not the National Park, the State Park, I guess, has quite a few pretty flat um, trails and stuff. So I think right. we're going to try that next. Yeah, that's right. really nice. <laughs> yeah, the Andy Guess, yeah, and I, there's yes. there's a little museum up there. Yeah, it is. That one, we uh, he has a hand pedal bike, so he's able to, I mean, he rides for like three miles, but it has to be pretty flat. So, so unfortunately, Front Royal is beautiful, but it's very mountainous. <laughs> so even in the neighborhoods, we don't do a lot of walking around in the neighborhoods, but, but we heard that one. So we're like, okay, we'll try that. See if that one's flat. The Arboretum uh, too is a, a really yes, great place. It's right, pretty the Arboretum is a good idea. Is that the one that's on 50, like when you drive? Okay, yeah. we'll try that too. I've seen that when we drive through. Yeah. That would it's be a great cool. place. It's yeah. beautiful. Very cool. Okay. okay, well, I think we're gonna wrap it up, but um, Don, this has been so interesting and um, I'm really glad that you were able to come on and talk with us tonight. Um, thank Thanks, you so you guys. much. This was fun. I had a great time. Thanks That's a lot. <laughs> does I'm anyone gonna... have any? Does anyone else want to jump in? I mean, I'm I'm happy to turn on, um, allow you to turn on your cameras too, if you like that. Well, real quick, real quickly, Don, I'd like to like to commend you on all the work you've done. Uh, I was a principal in Clark County uh, in the '90s. And I was the, an educational resource to the board uh, when the museum was downtown. Oh, cool. When Mary Bruce Glaze was just getting it started and all of that. And it was, even, even when it was getting started, it was the most fantastic place to visit. We, all of the classes at my school would go for field trips. And that was, it was such a wonderful experience. Uh, I, I took my own children when they were younger, but they're grown. One of them lives in Minnesota. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. Uh, but but we, we, we love to do museums and that kind of thing. Uh, I keep waiting for my grandchildren to come and visit so we can, we can take them to the new and improved because I know you all have been opening your new location quite a while now, but it still seems new to the, uh, those of us that have been around a while. <laughs> I, I, I commend you on the challenges you faced and the day-to-day -day work that you do. Uh, it is, it's just such a wonderful experience for kids and particularly young kids. Unless somebody's worked directly with early childhood, they really don't appreciate, I don't think, how much that kind of experience is enriching for a child. So that is so wonderful. For all you do. Joyce, I'm going to tell Mary Bruce, she's still very involved. I'll tell her that I met you virtually. That will be fun. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 
That's so cool. It's a small world here. I run into so many people that are like, oh, I used to be on the board. And I'm like, oh, I love that. <laughs> All nonprofits love to have people who helped bring them to be, because that's really what board members do for nonprofits. Very cool. Thank you. I All saw right. lots of people on the chat say that they're from Minnesota or no people in Minnesota. <laughs> this snow definitely makes everybody think of that. <laughs> Although I will tell you, so here's a funny little thing. We used to average about 54 inches of snow a year in Minnesota. And my daughter, who's in vet school, she is specializing in marine mammals. And so she is actually at an American vet school, but she is in Prince Edward Island. And they get 118 inches Ooh. of snow a year. No. So she literally right now has eight feet of snow <laughs> from just the last four weeks. So we're like, you're a glutton for punishment, child. <laughs> but yeah, I'm That's glad to be away snow. from snow, mostly away from snow, I should say. <laughs> yeah, we rarely get tons of snow. We have, yeah, we have record snowstorms throughout the years, but they're, you know, spaced. Yes. <laughs> These three weeks is the most snow that we've had. And this is our third Christmas here. So it just seems to be like right now it's decided that it's going to snow. And it looks like it might keep happening for a little bit. But yeah, my, da my daughter never complains about the snow. She complains about the cold. Yes. When yes. She called, when she called the other day, it was minus 22 when she went to work. And it was minus 13 when she came home. So. Uh. That's the thing people don't know. In Minnesota, there's actually times when it's too cold to snow. It gets 40 below air temp, and then there's no moisture in the air, so it won't snow usually in January or February. There's still snow on the ground, but it doesn't snow because it's too cold to snow. So, yeah, the 40 below air temp, that was what finally made me like, okay, we need to be done. <laughs> People should not live in this environment. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. thank you so much, Dawn. I really appreciate your generosity and your stories and um, and in appear and coming on for us and staying late. And thank you so much. Um, and okay, so people are Very continuing cool. to write in the chat, but I'm going to turn it over. Back over to Barbara. Uh, you know, I don't know that there's much else I have to say. Uh, you know, I tried to keep most of, of our information and announcements at the beginning. And I'll just repeat that Tina put a bunch of information in the chats. So, you know, um, please feel free to check us out. And yeah, and thank you, Don. This was this was fabulous. It was just so much fun to have you. You, <laughs> thank you, guys. you are you are a lot of fun. I have to agree <laughs> with your coworkers. It's like, oh. <laughs> you have great kid energy, and we all need that. <laughs> so yeah. thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you, guys. All right. Well, I, you know, I can't think of anything else. Um, I hope everyone has a fabulous evening and I hope to see you all back at the, the women's wellness workshop and our other gatherings. And we'll just, we'll just keep connecting and moving forward. <laughs>